Hey, welcome everybody. How you doing? Welcome to our Workbench Wednesday show, February 3rd, 2021. And tonight we are going to talk all about powering your G-scale trains. Everything from DC to DCC, RC, RC, DCC, R2, D2, and everything in between. So <laughs> we've got a, a big show here. And uh, if wait until you see the table that we have, uh, well, Bill set up. But uh, let's, uh, let's welcome Bill and Dave to the show here. Welcome, guys. Hello, everybody. Hey, Jeff. So uh, Dave, uh, we'll uh, quickly mention here that I know you've already printed off our uh, sheet, but if you haven't printed off all of the uh, the worksheets that go along with tonight's show, there's a link in the show notes that will take you to a PDF file that you can print. And it just it's great hand-drawn diagrams by Bill. They will be shown briefly on the show here, but you know, you'll want to see the trains more than looking at these diagrams. Um, it would really be best if you just jump over and print these off. So I'll give you like two minutes to go do that before we jump into chapter one, let's say. There will be a test after the program. Yeah, yes, and Bill <laughs> says there will be a test. And um, and and please uh, remind us if we're not talking loud enough. We're uh, really stretching the <laughs> limits of our microphones tonight. So um, uh, just remind us if we're not talking loud enough. We're going to do our best here tonight. So um, as you can see, I've done a little bit of decorating in my corner of my home studio here. Uh, there's some tools that came on my great grandfather's uh, toolbox. And uh, I, I think he was a dentist because I got this thing here. And I, I got this cavity and I could just, you know, really drill it out. Well, maybe not. But all right. Is two minutes up yet, right? Everyone's saying, come on, Jen, move on. <laughs> so... Um, anyways, um, let's, uh, let's move into, uh, chapter one here. Um, we have, uh, we're going to talk analog DC first, and I'm going to put little chapter notes. So if you're watching this in the future and you want to skip forward to a different chapter, I'm going to try to put up these little banners on the bottom that will show you where chapter one is analog DC. And we'll just move through these. And each page is numbered at the bottom so you can take a look at um, what chapter we're on and what diagram is going with that chapter. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's put up the, the first of our drawings. Bill, you have spared no expense here. Yeah, uh, our first Picasso. <laughs> Okay, so You're smarter just looking at it. These are just these are diagrams uh, that are to steer us through tonight's efforts. We're we're trying to accomplish in forty five minutes to an hour what on the internet is hours and hours of, of, of video time. So the object here is to introduce everybody to these systems and concepts. Again, this is intended for the, more over the beginner, certainly not the uh, long-term aficionado technician type for tonight. Uh, there'll be follow-ups to this, I'm sure, because controls are an ever-changing fa factor, function of this hobby. Uh, and even before we start with that, I wanted to catch up from our, my last presentation uh, because two items were brought to my attention and I'm always wanting to circle back around and make two uh, make make what comments to tidy those uh, presentations up uh, number one we talked when it came to switches manual switches uh, operators that manufacturers like uh, Pico AccuCraft provide manual switches for as add-ons in some cases and come with the switches as a starting point with Pico uh, to, to allow you to switch the, the points from the main line to the uh, siding, siding track. And I was reminded and therefore did want to bring to everyone's attention that Bachman also, where are we at here? Bachman also sells a retrofit kit that is a manual switch that also allows, and, and I, the nice thing about this is this is a universal kit 
that can be utilized not only on the Bachman switch products, but quite frankly, universally across all the switches I've come across so far. So with a little bit of uh, finagling, uh, and they do have instructions on this thing, uh, a, a good option if you're going to stick to manual, not get into the electronic or the air switches that we talked about previously. And in similar context, we always seem to come back to the metal finishing pad business. Uh, <laughs> Sore subject. Uh, I, the only reason I brought this back up is, lo and behold, here in, in the Columbus, Central Ohio area, I come to find out that the Menards Company is also handling this line. And in store, they're selling them for less than two bucks. Yeah. So I felt ripped off because I paid uh, three, three on, 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 on Amazon on the Internet. So. It was bucks. delivered to your house in one and, day, though. Well, yeah, there, there's <laughs> a, that compensation. But I just happen to live a, a, a block from Menards, so you that's do. not a big yep. deal. Okay, so there's those two little tidy-up things. All right, so let's get into tonight's efforts. Uh, we've, always, we've begun the other presentations with the starter sets because this is a beginner's course, basic controls, as we're talking about tonight. And therefore, the issues are going to focus on the controllers, where are we at here? Oh, yes, the controllers, yes, magic controllers. Okay, so it used to be when you got a starter set, you got one of these, a, what we affectionately used to refer to as a transformer, not the sophisticated term power supply, because, well, power supply costs you another 10, 20 bucks. Same thing. Okay, point being, what, ha what happened quickly over time, the manufacturers figured out that rather than provide a singular control device, speed control, direction control built into one, this is LGBs, Picos was very, it was, it was very similar, that they would split the issue up to where you would have the same control device, speed control, direction control built into the uh, one unit, and then they separated the more expensive transformer out in order to control costs. And so the, these days when you get starter sets, these things tend to be what's showing up, not the older style. But there's plenty of these out there. They're perfectly fine. And what I wanted to make comment on in either case is, because I somewhat flippantly commented, well, you just take those if you, once you get out of the starter set, circle around the track and pitch this stuff because it's not going to help you outside in the Garden Railroad. Well, that's not necessarily true. These function quite fine as auxiliary or accessory transformers for things like lighting in your structures. Sometimes you can work them also for power for the switch systems independently from running trains on the track. So don't throw them away. Keep them, utilize them. Thank you very much. We'll move on from a recycling standpoint. Best way to approach that. Okay. Uh, once you got away from the starter set, by the way, this is a less than amp transformer. And this is less than an amp transformer. Like we said, when it comes to starter sets, the engines basically have one motor less than an amp, and that's why these devices work. As soon as you expand, as soon as you want to run more than one engine on a track, or certainly a larger engine that has more than one motor, then these things become underpowered and, and won't satisfy the, the control needs for you. Uh, I have made previously a recommendation, and I'll repeat it again, that on average, you're, you need to look for something that has a five amp capacity to run trains. And I'm gonna make a distinction between its ability to run trains and power accessories, because that's another component here. Somewhere between five amps, which is a good starting point, and up to 10 amps. There are power packs out, there are power supplies out there that exceed that, but that creates a whole series of other issues. So somewhere in the five to 10 amp category typically suffices most Garden Railroaders desires for power and therefore control of trains. You can run multiple engines, you can run long trains, and you can handle most grades with these, that, that capacity, that power uh, input. And we'll get into what those mean here in a minute. 
Uh, once you get out of the one amp category, then you do start getting into larger boxes because it takes more metal and, and to, to handle the amp, uh, amperage and the overall power capacity of the units. Now, this happens to be a USA Trains one and has still the integrated control. Used to be in the old days, these were called rheostats. They're no longer rheostats. They're triax, but it still sounds good. It's speed control and direction control, which are still handled predominantly by switches for direction. Uh, and you can pretty much expect the higher, the, the larger the amperage and therefore the capacity, the larger the box becomes. And once you get up to, uh, here's a six amp unit. Where am I at here? No, we're a little out of frame, but I'll see what I can do here. The one I'm going to use to, to power the engine. There we go. You know, I'm, I'm going to drive Jed crazy tonight. Okay. And yes, this is a blue streak. And no, you can't easily find it on the market anymore, except in the retrofit or in the uh, post sale market. But this puppy is 30 years old and it's as good today as it was when I bought it. And so I've gotten all the money out of it I need. And it works quite fine these days for analog operation of the trains. Uh, has a built-in fan to keep the thing cool because once again, when you start getting bigger, you got to keep all the electronics cooler, and the fan helps in accomplishing that. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Hey, can I ask the USA train one that you held up, the larger one? This problem. Is that? Are you able to run more than one train with that? No, not really. Okay. It, it pretty ma much maxes out at. Uh, well, no, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. This is the older version. This is the amp and a half version. So that was basically one USA train, two motor blocks for the most part. So either two small engines or one larger engine. Uh, they did come out with a follow-up unit that literally used the same case, but did change the, the control components on it. And it, had, it has a four amp capacity. Therefore, yes, you can run multiple trains. Now, whether that's two trains MU'd together or two trains separately running around two different loops or different areas of the railroad, that's up, up to you. The power consumption is still the same in the scheme of things. Okay. You on the chapter two? Well, no, not oh, yet. Oh, sorry, sorry. Not yet. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, well, actually, yeah. Uh, go ahead and go to go to diagram two. Because we, we essentially touched on it with the small with the smaller controller, where all they did, you know, when you look at the diagram, all they did was split that apart. And the only thing I've added to our diagram here is an internal circuit board in order to accommodate the light components within the engines as the hobby developed. Uh, they found out the need to put in diodes in order to control the front light versus back light when you go forward versus oh, yeah. rear forward and it, it was easier to do it with a circuit board uh, rather than just hard wire uh, solder wire the, the stuff inside yeah i would imagine that would get pretty confusing okay now i'm going to drive you crazy if you would just quickly go back because i'll touch on one point here uh, back to diagram, the diagram one diagram one because I, I i drew up four little quickie uh, components to describe what we're talking about power wise let's see you, yeah i can't point to one here First, look down there where it says AC. Okay, so when you uh, deal with the control systems, uh, you're obviously plugging the stuff into the wall. And if, and if, of course, a lot of you, if you're old enough, came from the uh, O scale hobby, um, Lionel, American Flyer, you dealt with your, your power packs were were and still are, for that matter, if you're into those that por portion of the hobby. Uh, it's still AC, alternating current uh, uh, functioning. And just like the power that comes out of the wall for your house, the power is your lights and furnace and everything else, it's a waveform that has a plus and a minus side. And the amplitude defines uh, the total total power. And, and, and 
in the plus and the minus category to get what we you know, right it was the, the whole but, tesla verse yeah, edison when you, when you talk uh, 60 cycle at ac it's those those that waveform occurs 60 times in a uh, a second so mm -hmm. it's it's something that is very quickly defined okay so what happens with our model trains and particularly in the scale we're dealing with uh, the first thing that they typically did was rectify the the ac to produce dc well by i won't get into how that's accomplished other than to <laughs> say all they did was flip the bottom portion of the ac curve up to achieve a what was referred to as a rectified dc uh, waveform to provide dc direct current i uh, got to get into definitions here quickly i can see which we'll do in a moment and because they found out that uh, filtering that rectified dc provided less heat and more efficiency to the motors they provided filtering in the transformers which are buried in in the newer ones that filters the dc and gets rid of that crazy little bumpy waveform and produces a solid dc right. uh, current hence the word why we call the thing analog dc <laughs> okay. okay it's another way of saying filtered dc forgive okay. the terminology but that's where it is and before we leave the topic there is also a component called pulsed DC, which some of the manufacturers, I know Aristocraft originally utilized in their transformers, where you could flip from what uh, filtered DC to pulsed DC, pulse width control. Yeah. And that was solely because the Aristocraft motors were so big and the gearing was such that they wouldn't run slow and they were hard to start. And they found out by pulsing the DC uh, current that it would start the motors sooner therefore they would run slower to begin with look more realistic in the starting point the only hang up they found out over time as we got involved in all these electronics is the pulse dc creates problems uh, with interference and it heats up the motors and it it, it creates uh, as i say interference with uh, signaling which we'll get into with dcc Okay, we're done with diagram one. We move on. Okay. Diagram two, we basically touched on. Basically, all the only differences are what you can see there. I added lights, not to say that even diagram one couldn't have had lights on it. But they split the, the, the transformer component away from the control component simply as a cost saving feature until you get into the bigger transformers. And then the tendency is to recombine the whole thing because you're spending big bucks. You know, instead of a hundred bucks, now you're spending three and four hundred bucks for a transformer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Both those do the same thing. What we're, we're we're attached to the track. We're varying the voltage, and we flip the polarity to get the direction control. Yep. You go from plus to minus to minus plus by flipping that little switch, and we can run trains by doing that. All right. All right. Chapter three. Let's see. No, not oh, quite yet. Not yet. Oh. We're, we'll, that'll, we'll get there. <laughs> just, the, I'm just trying to move it along. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So what, what Jed commented on, what we're trying to touch base with on tonight is what we started with already, analog DC. We'll, we'll deal with and talk about digital command control, DCC. And then we'll deal with radio control. And actually, what we're probably going to do is deal with radio control across the board because radio control has tended to take over all three control methods, which I'll describe in a little more detail in a, in a moment here. I want to get back to what I felt was our basic control concept. So, you know, I, if you look at all this stuff on these tables, all this stuff is intended to do one thing, control, con allow you to run the trains, okay? <laughs> Whether it's battery at the far end of the issue or all this electrical uh, AC or DC discussion we just have begun with. Yeah. And, and what I want to get people's minds set on to begin with is say, hey, look, when you get into the decision-making business, keep two, two things simply in mind. 
And this goes back now. Can we flip to our engine here? Yep. Okay. There's, there's two issues to be aware of. One, and this is what you want from a modeler's perspective. Do you, as a garden railroader, do you simply want your trains to be able to turn on and run continuously, let's say, out in the garden? Maybe there's some switching here and there and some alternating left uh, in the sidings and, and whatnot that can be automated or done manually. But if the, the hobbyist tends to be either runners, as we call them, that go out and turn the thing on and you sit back on the deck and, and tip a brew while you watch the trains run and talk to your neighbors and, and everybody enjoys the railroad, or you're more hardcore and you want to be the engineer and you want to be able to control everything, not only the speed and the direction, but all the other issues that come along with whether it's steam or diesel, the lighting, forward and reverse, smoke, if it's steam, hopefully not. Well, yeah, I'll say there's a little bit of that regarding diesels too. There's smoke units there. And then the sound systems and all the stuff that has evolved in the sound systems to replicate the real thing. And then your ability to control each and every item or whether you just want to be able to turn the blooming thing on and let it do its own thing. Okay. Uh, what I got here tonight are two identical engines. Uh, this is a B&O 060. And inside it, and this is a cost factor, uh, the starter set engines, which we were talking to David at the beginning here, he said, hey, that looks just like my starter set engine. And I said, well, yeah, in a way, except that it costs twice as much because in addition to having a motor inside, where are we at here? Oh, yes, yeah, a motor. That's exactly what that motor looks like. It's also got all this electronic stuff, the, the decoder board, a sound board, a speaker and, 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 a, and a raft of wiring, <laughs> all to be able to replicate a real engine and all its features and give you the opportunity through controlling the train, the engine, to individually select all those when you want them, not when there's an automated electronic uh, pre-prescribed uh, pattern for it. Okay, I'm going to get off the engine for the moment. So the, the, the point is, a starter engine, eh, 150 bucks. An engine that has all the, the DC, the decoders and the sound systems and everything else, yeah, you're, 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 you're more than double that. Okay, so there's a cost factor involved. Whether you want to start out that way or whether you want to evolve into that, that's your choice. Any of the engines out there can all have these components. Hopefully the motor, you don't have to put a new motor in it. <laughs> All the electronic components can be put in afterwards if you have some technical abilities and care to disassemble your engine or you can pay someone else to do it all's fair and game in, in the process yeah. the other component i want to touch base with and is simply back to the track lo and behold what we've already talked about in the other two workshops do you want the track to be powered with electricity or not. Now, when we've talked already about track being powered, we've also talked about the necessity to clean the track. And we've also talked about the necessity to make sure that the sections between, between well, the, the rails between sections are coupled on a more permanent basis to maintain the elect electrical flow with rail clamps. Remember the discussion on rail clamps. And what do we clean our track with again? Oh, that Menards $1.97 clean <laughs> <laughs> paper in the scheme of things. All right, and, and I'll, t I'll, I'll make comment about this now. Running analog DC, which is a standard transformer here, will get you, and this is where we're gonna make some noise, I bet. So I'm gonna turn the transformer on. And we got our engine sitting there. Uh, 
And so we're now going to turn down the volume because all that fine electronics provides the opportunity for the engine to not only run, but the lights to turn on directionally, forward versus reverse. And the sound system is pretty much on its own. As long as the power is in the rails, you hear the sound of the chuff of the engine, the whistle, the bell, and a little bit of brake squealing. All happens just because you're turning the power on and off. And on animal. Every Pico engine in minimum comes with this equipment now, doesn't it? Uh, you will choose because it's a cost factor. Whether you want sound in the in the engines or not, and whether you want a DC decoder board in the engine or not, uh, that stuff doubles the cost of the the engine in, in simple form. Please don't give me you know the, the, the minutia on that issue. In general, you can you're going to cost it's going to cost twice as much to do that, and that's fair if you're willing if that's where you want to go. Hey. It's a hobby, right? You do what you want to do. Okay. Hey, Bill, if I can interject just real quick. So, yep. Jed, my uh, Pico starter set didn't come with any sound or anything else, um, but I have seen since that time. <coughs> yeah, I didn't know what I was looking at. I saw the cheapest one, and it looked good, so I picked it up. Uh, but since that time, I've seen starter sets that are even more expensive, and as I start to read the box a little bit more, it's because they exactly, like Bill was saying, they have – sound and some different features so yeah there's uh there sky's the limit on whatever you want to spend on uh really with starter sets even so, yeah i will say this you will get a bigger bargain big bang bigger bang for your buck if you purchase all that the, the sound system if you will associated with the starter sets because again the manufacturers discount them if you try to buy all those components separately it's like an automobile you know it, it'll cost you twice as much as if you buy all those parts in a in a combined starter set yeah. so a, a good way to start out some uh, you look through the pico catalog and, and half of what's offered now in the starter sets have sound in them Half of them don't, and that's a direct reflection of the cost associated with it. You can pay now or you can pay later, I guess, is how you've got to look at that. Yep. If you want all those features. Okay, so start the process out by deciding what you, what you as, a, as a model railroader, as a hobbyist, want to do. Do you want to turn the trains on and let them run? Then maybe all the high flutin electronics may or may not be necessary for your needs or your ability, let's say, to control them in individual ways. And whether you want power on the track or not, again, I'll say this, the analog systems, why do those come that way with the starter sets? Because they're the least expensive and, and yet most effective way to, to get you started and run um, the sets. I know a couple of manufacturers have attempted to offer DCC, uh, direct command control. Uh, I'm sorry, digital command control in starter sets, and it's been a flop because again, the sets are you know, like a thousand bucks, and nobody wants to spend a thousand bucks when they go out and spend three three hundred and twenty five dollars, and and go from there. Okay. So pretty much the more sophisticated electronics tend to be add-ons or separate purchases after the after the starter set business. Okay, now, now touch now base. Now we're three. On diagram three. I know you, you're just biting at the bit to get to it. Uh, David asked me, because I've already thrown around some terminology uh, to define a few things. Okay, I'm going to quickly do that. I've mentioned the word voltage. Uh, the trains run from zero to normally 22, maybe 24, depending on the transformer, volts. Well, what is voltage? Well, basically, that's the force or the pressure that moves the electrons in the wire, or in this case, in the rail. It's At home, you have 120 volts. Well, we don't have that here. We have 
let's say 22 volts. We don't need all that push to get the electrons to flow in the, in the rails. I mentioned before, you know, just touch base here, voltage drop. What is voltage drop? It's the percent of reduction in the voltage from your power source where you connect your wires to the track, to the end of the track, wherever that may be. You will always have voltage drop. And what voltage drop does with respect to the engines and therefore the trains is it slows them down. And it possibly, if you've got enough voltage drop, will slow them down enough to stop them. So you have to accommodate, and that's why we made the point to make sure that the wire that connects between the transformer and controller and the power supply to the rails is large enough so that you, you minimize the voltage drop problem. Uh, you can run a thousand feet of <clears throat> this, this kind of track, the sectional track, and, and really not really have a major problem with voltage drop because as long as the, the, the rail clamp, as long as you use rail clamps and the track is continuous, you'll be fine with regard to voltage drop. Um, current. Well, what the heck's current? Well, it's the volume. Not, not the, Remember we said voltage is the force or the pressure? Well, current is the volume of electrons that flows in the rails, and we have typically refer to those as amperes. Now, why do I even go into this? Well, when you go to buy a transformer, all that stuff by virtue of the UL listing, Underwriters Laboratory, is listed somewhere on it because it's mandatory. So you know what the heck you're buying and you can figure out how much voltage and amperage, which we generally refer to as power when you combine those two terms, is contained in your transform. Uh, Quickly, polarity is obviously the plus or minus business of how the electrons flow one way in one rail and back to the transformer in the other rail. And when you flip a switch, those reverse directions, and as a result, the engine motor reverses direction for you, okay? Uh, AC, already commented, alternating current. Uh, DC, direct current. Filtered DC, we've touched based on with our diagram. Uh, it's the straight line electron flow that's been uh, modified from its waveform. And the last point that I is our power formula, because again, it goes back to transformers and how they're rated. You will see terms like they will list the voltage both into the transformer and coming out to the trains. They will also list at least the current of the transformer in ampere in amperes and they will state more often than not the com combination of those two in the form of what, what we generally refer to as power in the form of watts in what are what is normally listed out as va volt amps okay for our purposes volt amps is power is watts and we move on when you look at the back of the transformers right there there's all those there's all that information. So you should know right off the bat exactly what you're getting, even though they don't tell you on the front, because that's what UL requires. And just real quickly, compliments of our uh, USA engine here. Input, 120 volt, 44 watts, 0.37 amps. Ooh, not very much. Total output. Now, understand that's on the incoming side. Once it goes through the transformer and comes out to your trains on the other side, the output is 19, 19 volts, 15 VA, volt amps, 15 watts, if you will. So if you quickly do the math on that, you'll find out that, well, that it's, it's adequate to run one, one engine, okay? Even though it's bigger. You, th th this, this basically is the same output as these buttons right here, okay? Now... If that's not adequate, then you got to go find one that's re rated bigger, and off you go in that direction. Why I tried to deal with the definitions, because ultimately it's a help for you. And, and so when you're looking for a transformer, because everything that requires electric power, short of battery, has to have a transformer in the, in the circuit. Which brings up the, first, the next thing I wanted to touch base on before you get on the diagram three. <laughs> Sorry, you're dying on it. Because you're dealing <clears throat> on the front end via the transformers with a cord and plug and therefore back to your house, 
And because these things are outside, I want to make sure everybody understands you should be plugging into what is referred to as a GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupt connect, uh, receptacle. Why? Because it'll keep you from getting electrocuted while you're out playing with your trains. Actually, yeah, particularly on the, the high voltage side of the transformers. You know, uh, do not leave any electronic piece of equipment outdoors without permanent covers to keep mother nature never made that lighting. mistake <laughs> yeah everybody's been there and done that right they say well it's, it's just a little low voltage well yeah it's a little low voltage except you're plugging in on the front end side to electricity that quite frankly can can really zap you under the best of circumstances and if you totally screw up potentially stop your heart from beating which i believe was called death on the secondary side okay we move on i'm not i don't need a lecture in electronic or electrical or engineering here tonight this device is purposely designed to protect this whole system and you predominantly from from shock hazard outdoors so whether you plug in the garage or whether you plug into a receptacle that's already outside of your house make sure it's got this on it should have yeah but some older homes don't yeah and also a good way you, when you're done running at the end of the end of the day is to really just unplug that transformer from the wall oh, well, to make gets, sure it's... which gets me yes to the next no is that point. am i stealing your thunder here no, Sorry, but, no. Uh, you need right in i thank you very much I, i've woken up in the middle of the night going understand I turn that off? understand what you've done with a garden railroad you've taken number six brass solid brass two two solid runs of it we call the track and ran it all over your backyard now, if I was building a house and I wanted lightning protection on the house, what would I do? I'd run electric, a copper wire on the top of the house from lightning rods down the house mm -hmm. and put it into the ground to protect the house from, from lightning. Now, what happens is what you've inadvertently done is create an excellent lightning <laughs> attractor. <laughs> <laughs> so what I recommend is... You, you can't control Mother Nature. And I'm not saying that it's going to cause a lightning strike to hit your railroad. The problem we see on a, on a number of occasions are what we refer to as ground strike lightning. The lightning strikes down the block a, 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 a 200 and some feet away. It still pulses the ground. If you've ever been in your garage working on your car, laying on the garage floor working on like an oil change, and there's a crazy lightning strike somewhere in the neighborhood, It'll cause your hair to stand up because of that pulse coming. Okay. Yep. If you Dave and I can the, relate to that. Back to the railroad. <laughs> back to the railroad. It does the exact same thing. And obviously, if it's close enough or strong enough, it will pulse it. And if you have your engines with had all this you know, thousand dollars worth of electronics in it, uh, or other electrically connected issues, uh, you stand a reasonably good chance of, of them frying out. Um, so what we recommend are don't leave your trains on the track without isolating them. And that could be something as switch, simple as a switch, or obviously you can take them off. And meanwhile, back to the electronics, the controls, the, the, all this fancy stuff that's maybe in, in a shed or in your garage or somewhere in order to power stuff. Uh, it's always best to provide a switch that you can flip at the end of the day to isolate all this all these expensive electronics from the rails and it's just it's just a switch a t normal toggle switch will do it for you because it simply isolates the controls from the track okay now we haven't gotten anywhere near controls except that we're working our way there as Bill, as you're explaining that, I, I keep thinking back to this summer when I have my first setup outside. And, and from what you're saying, I gather that covering up my electrical outlet with a, a rock is probably not the best option. We'll read about you in the newspaper, sir. Right. <laughs> All right, right let's learn. And, and again, the, the, this is a fun hobby. We want to maintain, we want to make sure, is you know, we don't have Garden Railroad that's dropping dead left and right on the issue but it you know don't you be the one out of a thousand that, that winds up you know 
experiencing a problem. Okay. Right. And this is the way you can address those. Okay. Chapter three. Analog DC. Yes. We, we've arrived at that point. Let's go ahead and uh, pull up diagram three because it, it's, it's the closest. <laughs> okay. A little, little bit of how we got here on diagram three. All right. We started out with a good old transformer plugged in and connect on the, to the house that ultimately feeds low voltage power DC to the rails. And then the manufacturers got tricky trying to reduce costs and split the things up, but essentially it's all the same. Well, okay. Now when we get to, we're still in analog DC, but one of the problems with all these transformers, they're big, they're heavy, and they're static. You turn the trains on, and you walk away, and if a problem occurs, you got to run back and turn the train. Well, hopefully, you can turn the trains off with the controls. Well, nobody likes that because that reduces some of the fun of the hobby. And and again, back to the hey, I want to run my trains. I want to be the engineer. I want to be with the be with the trains. It progresses through the the yard, um, and and the way that the manufacturers were able to address that was simply by providing a walk around control, which I have here. This is one of the original ones that are, uh, Aristocraft, who no longer is in business and therefore this is no longer made, uh, provided. It was, once again, a very simple device. It sped the trains up, it slowed the trains down. It changed the direction one way, changed the direction the other, and actually had a few additional, oh, had the magic emergency, press the button, immediate shutdown, stop sure. button, Always a good and, button. It, and then a few other buttons that never really worked real well. Okay. I digress. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Hey, Bill, would that only be usable with Aristocrat, or can you use that with other? Oh, okay. in, in the Columbus Garden Railway Society, I will profess that even to this day, Certainly, the older members, the vast majority of us, still utilize. I still utilize this for that matter. Uh, why? Because just like my transformer that's pushing thirty years old, it still works and satisfies my needs to turn the trains on, speed them up, slow them down, let them go forward, let them go backwards. While well, I got this snapped on my belt, and I can walk around the railroad, watching the trains, working on the railroad, talking to folks, that kind of deal. And if a screw up occurs, I can hit the emergency button. And everything comes to a grind and halt immediately. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Now, the way that was accomplished is what I show in that diagram. It required an additional box that was a receiver. This is a transmitter. This is a receiver. And all this does is interface between the transformer. Oh, let's use this one. It'll work. Between this transformer, before it connects to the before it goes through the controller, and the, no, I don't want to say it that way. The transformer through the controller, before it connects to the rails, this device got set in between. And that's what I show on my diagram. Okay. Now, it doesn't change the system. It's still analog. You still essentially run one engine per track section with that controller. Yes, you can put two engines on the same track, but you don't have independent control. Both trains run, let's say, simultaneously because they're both drawing the same power off the rails simultaneously. The trains go forward, the trains go backwards, all the same. You don't have independent control. This has sufficed for quite a while, but as I say, Aristocrats no longer in business. And so you either find it on the resale market or, lo and behold, uh, Pico came up with their version of the same gizmo. There's their box, similar but different, because once again, they split out another transformer. So now you get two transformers, by the way, because uh, this plugs into here and runs the trains not through a big, somewhat bulky controller, 
but through this crazy little looks like your car key quite frankly you speed them up you slow them down and you have two other functions that you can push for bells and whistles and whatever thing you know, things of that nature the lights are pretty much automatic the sound is, is automatic no different than when I turn the transformer on here okay so that's out there for your you can always add a magnet to the track for additional sound yeah you, if you put magnets on a track the, the, the whistle inside will will, will automatically will blow at that location at that, that kind of thing okay all right real the the, the advantages to the analog DC system is it's the lowest cost solution to be able to simply run your trains. Some of the disadvantages, well, you got to still keep the track clean. And I'm going to use the word clean, not pristine clean, just clean. Yeah, it can get a little bit dirty and the trains will still run. They might get a little halty, but they'll, they'll work over some of the dirty spots. You do have to still accommodate what I call special wiring. I didn't get into this too much. Don't know how we need to do it, but I'll, I'll simply make a quick point. Most of us somehow, when we arrange our track plans, screw up somehow, some way, and produce what we call a reverse loop, meaning that somewhere you got a train that starts, goes out, loops around, and comes back on itself as opposed to continuing on on a, on a separate loop, okay? When you do that, you create an immediate short because the plus rail becomes the minus rail, the minus rail becomes the plus rail. And just, you know, you have to isolate that out, whether you run battery, the, the, the more sophisticated battery, or even stick with the standard analog transformer-based system. Now, that's been with us and it still remain main with us and you have to be aware of that uh, so reverse loops even wise which is similar but different it is what it says when you, when you do that because once again you follow the track you, the plus becomes the minus the minus becomes the plus and you got isolated I don't want you know, I'm not getting into track wiring tonight uh, there's ways to accomplish that, either manually or electronically. So there's always solutions. But the problem will be there, and you have to accommodate it. Doing all this, putting all this stuff and spending all this money doesn't solve that problem. You have to solve that problem separately. Yeah. And if you want to run multiple trains, you have to provide what we call block wiring. You have to isolate tracks independently from one another. So most, I think LGB had that system pretty much whipped where you had one common transformer, you run multiple trains, they all ran at once, but they were technically all running off the same transformer at the same speed. And it required electronics to switch things in and switch things out, stop things and start things, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all that's still out there for your, for your hobby pleasure. Okay. So, and because this is the lowest cost system, literally every manufacturer, Pico, LGB, USA, Bachman, MRC, model rectifier, and Bridgeworks, which is probably at the top of the pile, if you care to spend $2,000 for a transformer, you can do that. Um, that'll handle multiple trains on multiple tracks. Bridgeworks offers combined transformers up to, you can run four separate trains on four separate loops if you care to spend two grand to do it. It's all relevant in the scheme of things. Uh, and probably Bridgeworks is still at the top of the pile. There's there's an example of Bridgeworks' single track 10 amp transformer that costs 400 bucks thereabouts. Okay. Didn't care to bring that with me. Way too big, way too heavy. Your car was pretty full when you got here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. But all that's again, the, the, the hobby is replete with transformation equipment out there. But all these same principles we're trying to touch base on tonight help. Chapter four? We're on to chapter, actually, I'm going to get you to flip to 
the five because I'm going to violate my own my own standards of process and touch base on DCC. How are we doing on time, by the way? Uh, we're fine. Okay. Well, I'm, going to, I'm simply going to touch on DCC so that you understand what the term is and what the term means and how you basically can control the train. There's hours of possible capacity of learning with regard to DCC systems, the inside garden model railroaders, the HO crowd particularly, have been dealing with DCC for quite a few years. And I think most of the manufacturers have, have used them as the training ground for developing the DCC systems in large scale. And yes, Jed, this is where we now get to also move the camera to our DCC table. How's that? Okay. And I'm going to actually move myself. Uh, David, let me know if you can still hear me. All right. Everybody enjoy the diagram while we do a set change here. Yeah. And Bill, while you guys are doing a set change, you had mentioned earlier that I had asked you to like go through some definitions and things. And again, my purpose here is to be that new guy because all of this stuff is new. And I think I learned more in the first five minutes of this than I knew, period. So um, in, at the Garden Railroad meetings, you know, people would talk about DC and DCC, and I thought those were the only two options. They'd ask me what I ran, and I didn't really know, but I figured it was one of those two. And um, as you pointed out, little did I know, uh, when you get a Pico starter set or the one that I did, then it, it runs on analog. So um, already learning so much, um, I don't think I'll ever understand those pictures, but um, at least what you're showing us, you know, it's, it's clicking. So it's something I definitely needed. And I think this will benefit any new person. We're on diagram. Into the hobby. We're on diagram. Diagram. Five. Okay. So after everybody got tired of monkeying around with analog and saw the HO guys running trains that they could control every possible little piece of the engines, lights, sound, whistles, bells, steam hiss, uh, engine run up. I'm trying to bounce between diesel versus steam here. I have to say, as the hobby has evolved, the G scale hobby has evolved, the major manufacturers have headed off into the DCC direction. Uh, Pico, LGB, predominantly. Uh, have come up with sophistic, really some sophisticated systems. Oh, Lord, there goes mine. I brought one of Pico's here with me tonight. This is probably at this point in time the top of the pile with regard to DC G scale DCC operation. Uh, simply to show it to you and prove that yeah, you can run trains with it, but more importantly, not only can you run trains but you can also control every cotton picking facet of those trains. You can, okay. you can turn, not only can you turn everything on like you did in analog and operate forward, reverse, lights and all that jazz, you can control each and every one of those little features. You can turn the, you know, you can turn the lights on, you can turn the lights off, you can ring the bell, well, if I turn the volume up. All right, so. Um, okay, so you can drive your neighbors nuts and probably your wife along with them. Because you have individual control, both volume as well as function, complements of the controller. Now, when the systems started out, both LGB and you and Pico, and in some of the in a lot of the I'll say independents, there's many manufacturers out there, Nice, Digitrax, MRC, that offer systems that operate the G scale trains. When they all started out, they were all tethered to the control. Well, once again, just like our indoor analog solution, nobody liked the fact that the transformer sitting there, you always had to return to it. So what they did, 
they finally wised up and provided once again RC radio control so you can unplug the bloody thing and walk with it now this is quite frankly just like your smartphone and that's where the hobby has evolved you can not only program in everything but you can change everything just don't lose it because it's as expensive as your smartphone <laughs> okay and don't leave it outside in the rain this is the direction the hobby has gone because both the manufacturers have pushed it that way with the technology and a, the majority of their customers are demanding it. but i must say i'll draw a line here in my experience the demand for this component of the hobby, DCC, has predominantly been an indoor, there's still quite a few indoor G-scale operators that find the systems just quite fine. The caution for anybody who wishes to use DCC, and this gets to the advantages and disadvantages, I already touched on the advantage, you can control everything. Not only the engines, but the switches, anything else you want to connect to it. The biggest disadvantage is back to those rails because you still have to provide power in those rails. Not only like you started out with DCC analog, or I'm sorry, not just like you started out with analog DC, but now you're introducing a high frequency signal in addition over those same rails in order to control the train. It's kind of like morse code kind of yeah think of it as that's a fair code. that's a fair statement it is a it is a pulsed digitized signal yeah. that runs parallel with the power to run the yeah. trains and we've already beat you simple with how important it is to keep the rails clean well if you're going to run dcc you aren't going to be able, the system will not allow you to have dirty rail right. so i uh, i will profess every time you go to out the run trains you're going to wind up cleaning the track maybe more than what you would prefer but if you don't do that you're going to run into problems with the control system right. club members i know that have dc would be alvin mann and Seem to know one or two others, I would believe. And, and I know Albert. Yeah, well, it, well and it, Ron, Ron runs DCC on his, I believe. But his is indoors. Oh, so he's yeah, he's off the hook. <laughs> uh, I, I, I the, the, as I've said before, I think the poster child within our club has was is Gary uh, Jerry Clink, who had a phenomenal MTH Mike's train house. Uh, G scale railroad Huge. as part of his Huge. overall layout, and he dearly loved it. He spent a ton of money on it, and he always had to fight it <laughs> to get it to run right. <laughs> so, there's the only caution I don't want to dissuade anybody from considering DCC. My job here is to inform you of the advantages and disadvantages. And oh, yeah, the last disadvantage is, as you might suspect. All this stuff, just like your smartphone, is exquisitely expensive. And you're going to spend more money with it than the other, the other solutions we're, we're touching base on with tonight. I move yeah. on. Talk about the, the manual. You said anything that requires a 100-page manual to know how to operate it is going to be expensive. And say, you know, one of, one of the nifty little things that I that's happening here right now is my, the control's off. In fact, you know, I can put it down, walk away, and the train will continue to run until I come back and say, hey, uh, we're done. With it. Thank you very much. Oh, it'll just go along this fairway and just have an analyst and turn the train around. Okay, we're going to move on. Time is precious here tonight. All right, next so, chapter. Next chapter. We just touched base with five, haven't we? Next is six. And I, I, I will remember about six. Now, well, in fact, I really did. By, by this connecting this controller, we demonstrated 
we've gone from a tethered system to a radio control system. And that's how the bug has evolved. Most of the CC that I run to now is a radio control radio component of it. So that you walk around wherever it's in or around. So that comes around five, six. It's the only thing that's separated the RC component to the overall scheme of things. One thing we, well, maybe the only difference here is by incorporating the RC, we have one additional advantage that we can incorporate a re the receiver not just in a base station, but we can incorporate a receiver in individual engines and therefore have individual operation of each engine, which is pretty much the, the, the norm. So it'll work either way. And there's the difference between diagrams five and six. It, it just means you're cramming more electronics inside the engines. As a result. So with that, I'll move on to our last segment here, that of radio control. This will be chapter seven. This will be chapter seven as he runs back to the computer. Once we get to pure radio control, battery operation. Is the, the, the term. David, can you hear me okay on the mic, all right? Yep, I can. Okay. Then we dump all the we, we dump all this transformation equipment. To some degree, we even dump a little bit of the control aspects of DCC. Uh, not totally. The DCC board still come to our rescue in some regard. But what we do then by incorporating the power by way of batteries in the actual engine or maybe even a trailing car itself. In this case, for our little starter engine, there's our batteries. Oops, are we able to see what's going on? Yeah, there we go. Uh, six uh, rechargeable cells to fit back into the engine engine in its compartment and this is this is a simpler version i don't have a sound card in this one although the sound cards available now and the simple bottom line is you know yeah has all the basic features goes forward goes backwards lights turn on frontwards lights turn on backwards i can keep it from derailing or It don't care whether it's on the track or not. It'll run, okay? <laughs> and therefore, you have that added advantage and, and, and maybe even the, the added advantage of taking your trains to someone else's railroad, whether they have analog DC, whether they have DCC itself, doesn't matter as long as you can isolate your engine. Uh, you can run you can run train your trains on their track with your control okay there's three dominant systems out there that i come across are we up yeah we got seven up there yeah and and all we've done by the way is eliminate all that hardware therefore the track itself is what we affectionately now refer to as dead rail there ain't no power in it and the advantage to that is you, know, you don't have to clean it and if you don't want to even go to the route route of the rail clamps, or if you know you don't have to keep the rail clamps up to snuff either. Um, as long as it provides a guide path for the train, you're in good shape. You still got to keep the leaves and the bird dew and, and the rocks and all that kind of stuff, the limbs and all the sticks off track track, but it's far easier to deal with in the in the overall picture of things. Uh, some of the dominant systems that are out there. There's Airwire, which has been on the market for years. We have gotten sophisticated on all categories. Quite frankly, their systems, they have alternate systems that'll 
use their controller to run on analog DC, on DCC, as well as battery only. If you run their systems on battery, you start getting into this thing. This is the battery, okay? Not necessarily suited for this engine, but on the other hand, it's this is made for a large uh, diesel engine that would pull 30 cars and last roughly three to four hours of run time. And comes with a charger, just like your power tools. After three or four hours, it poops out. You got to stop, plug it in to a charger for yeah, 12 hours <laughs> right. in order for it to charge back up. So it, there's costs associated with these things. Um, you're going to be into the five, $600 category by the time you deal with the well, there's an electronic board that you have to put in to accept it is a receiver that accepts the signal from the controller. And then you got the batteries you're working with in the scheme of things. These are lithium ion, not cheap, but they're light, twice, twice, they're twice as light as the old nickel cadmiums and last and, and provide an, almost twice the power. Uh, in, in the same package size. So we've come a long way there. Yeah. Uh, what do I want to, well, my own engine here. Oh, well, in fairness to, okay, I mentioned Airwire will work in this category. Aristo, well, I don't want to say Aristo now, it's now Crest Electronics. The train engineer, the revolution will work in the same category. And the newest guys on the market with regard to G-Scale, I think where we're at here picture-wise, we good here? Yep, you're good. Is a company called ProRail. Okay. Now, what these guys have done as a further evolution of the hobby, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you got a receiver, you got a DCC board, you got a sound board, you got speakers, well, you're still going to have speakers in, in that. What they've done is combine all of those electronics with one device. One, one uh, I'll call it a decoder. This is it. This is the sound card, the receiver, and the DCC board all in one. And I'm impressed with what they've accomplished. And cost-wise, they've managed to reduce the cost down as a result. And probably the most important thing, different from the airwire system, is they've made it pic pictorially understandable. You, you press pictures of what you're wanting to do, the whistle, the bell. The airwire system uses numerical values. you got to remember that, oh, button one is the bell, and button two is the whistle, that kind of deal. They've done it pictorially and also the ability to change their diagram on your behalf. So quite impressive. And there's the, re the uh, TARC Triac that controls your speed, and uh, speed in the system. So again, a further evolution of where the hobby's going. Uh, when I looked at the pricing for the, the starter sets, 400 bucks. So they got the price down too. Probably the only hang up is right now, if you're, oh, this system is geared for the diesel crowd, okay? Uh, all their sound units, all the bells and whistles. They, they have, you can uh, control 28 different lights, whether they're ditch lights, step lights, headlights, marker lights, cab lights, on and on I go. You have the individual ability to control each one of them by pressing a different button here on the controller. Yeah. And so too with the sound, starting up, running, brake squeal, coupler clank, the whole nine yards, all from the controller here. Really set up for the diesel crowd. So far, I've been disappointed so far. They tell us that they're getting there. They're trying to retro go back and deal with the steam crew because there's still some of us alive out there and we'll we'll, I'll, we'll wait to see i if, if i I'm, I'm a steam aficionado and if i'm going to go to the trouble and expense of doing this i want i want to have them with the 
uh, full range of steam capability in the scheme of things. Okay, enough for that. Yeah, and they don't have any European whatsoever. Not yeah. From for what we've talked about earlier, nothing on the European. So if you're in European diesel, European anything yeah. at this juncture, they're strictly USA guys into the current, you know, the, the contemporary diesel end of it. So if you're into that, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Last thing here, maybe. Yeah. This is this scares everybody off at the end too, right? <laughs> All right, uh, you'll hear terminology called plug and play. All right, a number of the manufacturers, USA, for example, this is Bachman's, one of Bachman's tenders. This is how it comes from the factory. Look at all the electronics in there, okay? It's not intended to scare you off, but by George, yeah, it takes a pretty heavy wiring diagram to explain what this thing's connected to everything individually so you can run DCC in these things. And you're going to hand draw a diagram. No, I'm not. As a matter of fact, if, if I'm going to deal with diagrams, I had to print it off the, the internet in order to understand it even myself. When they talk about plug and play, what they're saying is the board, the, the train does not come with a DCC board. It doesn't come with a sound board. This one does come with a speaker. I was amazed because it's so darn hard to get to. If you'd have to disassemble the whole thing. So they, they throw in the speaker and charge you, you know, another 50 bucks for the price of the engine. What what happens is you can take this board out, which is just a jumper board, and you can put, in this case, here's Aristo's uh, RC radio control receiver. Plugs right in. If I can get them in the right slots. There we go. Right into, and there ain't no soldering and there ain't no wiring, as we touched base with. I think that was a workshop one, how to do soldering. soldering right. It's all done. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's out there, and that's what that's meant to imply, plug and play. Now, you, comp well, you, you, there's always issues you have to deal with, whether you're satisfied with what they give you in the plug and play category. If you want to mix sound systems, if you uh, don't like the manufacturer's sound system and you want to use a Tsunami, which is one manufacturer's brand, or Phoenix, well, then you're going to get into wiring. That's the only way you're going to get there from here. And, you know, it, that's a hobby in itself. It's uh, electronics uh, soldering 101. Okay? All right. I think we've worked our way through all our diagrams, too, didn't we? David, any questions at this point? Are you totally confused? Uh, there's a lot to take in, but, no, I, I think I'm tracking so far. I might have to go back and watch some parts, but Turn around. good explanation. All right. Uh, again, strictly an overview gives you an idea of what is out there for you to select from. Well, and whether you and okay, if I'm going to make a recommendation, which apparently I am because I just said I would, I would suggest for new new folks start out with the analog system. It's perfectly fine. It'll so, it'll suit you for for some time. Yes, you have to start out with your track like we've guided you along so far in these workshops so that the, tr the track works to your favor, maintains electrical continuity, and is isolated apparently as of this workshop from both lightning and shock hazards. And then you can become more sophisticated whether you choose to get involved in the electronics and the sound, which I'm sure you will, because we all have, then fine, go for it. The trains will run on analog, even with the, the DCC soundboards in them, and maybe they'll be quite fine for your needs and desires. If you want to become more sophisticated, yes, you can get into the DCC issue and, and just go crazy with the, the capabilities and the, the um, intricacies of how you get there from here. And then there's the rate control systems that, that sort of eventually, you know, junk all this yeah. <laughs> and, and, and turn you loose uh, totally independently of every, everything else by way of the battery operation. Yeah. And, and now the batteries are long enough in terms of operating time that you'll be quite, you know, I, I think most of us are happy. I mean, you, after four hours, you're kind of. Yeah. Uh, the uh, open and, house and that tour depends on the, the engine. I mean, some yeah. of the small engines will run up to six and eight hours. On a, on a larger battery like that. 
whereas the bigger engines that have more more power to them will, will consume the power quicker. But if that's the case, then you just get a second battery for a mere couple, you know, 200 bucks. Have it already charged up so when the other one craps out, you can swap them out if as one methodology of doing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, loose ends, loose ends. There's always loose ends in this business. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Andrew, uh, Mr. Pictovid uh, has asked if we're going to have a quiz or if it's quiz time. Um, so what, uh, what quiz can you, uh, give us at this point that will leave us all hanging <laughs> oh, hanging till next time <laughs> until mm. next show. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, what to do, what to do. <laughs> well, we can, we can start out by saying, uh, Oh, uh, I got a question from Bob Duggan. He wants to know, can you do DCC or RailPro on a point-to-point? -point? On a point-to-point. -point. Well, are you wanting the point-to-point -to, -point to be automated? Because as long as you're dealing with DCC, you can automate it, quite frankly, back through a PC uh, as, a, as a control mechanism. Uh, yeah. But... I guess once again, even if you're in the analog DC business, you know, there's already the, the pre existing, uh, you know, the end bumper systems that Aristo and LGB and Pico offer. Well, I, I guess I got to get into the Pico and LGB end of it because those are viable products you can purchase right now. Uh, the Aristo would be an aftermarket issue. Uh, do fine. All you're doing is reversing the polarity in the rails. Yeah. And as, as long as well, you're slowing the engine down, hopefully, before it hits the end bumper <laughs> and, and speeding it back up. And those are all accommodated through the electronics. And, and those electronics so, don't change. Yeah. So it is a uh, yeah. simple answer, yes, but it's uh, you got to program it to do it more. Or well, less. The, yeah, the DCC, the, the pre existing electronics associated with not the engine, but with the uh, bumper system accommodates that. And they're buried in there because all are, again they're, they're swapping the polarity and and varying the voltage up and varying the voltage back down again depending on where the engine is along the track no different than was what, what it was on a pure analog dc basis um the um the business all the dcc equipment that you buy and spend more money for will run on analog dc these, you just won't have all that individual control. Just like I showed you here tonight by turning my transformer on, the, the DCC engines, by the way, both of these are identical, uh, will run on analog DC. You just don't have the individual, you know, they, they just run on it. The sound runs on automatically. Yeah. You know, uh, you don't have individual abilities to control the different components of the sound, is, is where that's at. So, uh, but but that's you know it gets it gets you where you want to go down the pipe if if you're trying to evolve and, and have fun with the trains. Um, the idea is to make this as simple as possible. You know this is really a kind of complicated deal, but at the same time <laughs> we're trying to make it simple enough to to encourage you. Uh, you know th this touches base. I, I, again, I got in the, the DCC end of it. Uh, you know I, I I ran diagrams. Lordy B. You know, I, I ran pictures of, of all the systems out there that are available. There's, there's MRCs, but they all basically look alike. The most expensive one is uh, Zemo, but it's the most flexible and, and covers everything possible in the world in terms of controls. But, it, it, you know, is that where you want to be? That's up to you. That's your personal decision. I'm not here to tell you one way or the other there. Yeah, it's all personal preference. Uh, like you said, if you want to just put a train on the tracks and drink a beer with your buddy and watch it go round and round, DC analog is the way to go. And and probably a little bit of RC control just to be able to turn it off maybe on a quickly if, if needed. Um, well, I, and, and I mean, I, I have a Home Depot outlet that came with a remote control that as long as within 50 feet, I can hit the panic button and turn off the power right. well, on that and, outlet, and, and that works. And now, keep in mind too, in, in RC battery control, 
it's it has a DCC board in the engine, and therefore you do have individual control of all that blooming stuff that you have with the with the uh, pure DC DCC system. Yeah. Uh, you you just aren't tethered to the rail if you want to look at it that way for its, for your power source, and, and has that advantage going for it. Um, and the manufacturers are constantly modifying this stuff. I'll even, you know, like the Pico system. Yeah, I mean, you, you can finagle running battery on the engines too. Uh, one of the things that I'll finish off with, where is that? Oh, here, 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 here. So you got all this stuff and all this money, and, and, that, and, and you know, people are complaining, oh, you know, I'm spending too, too much money trying to play with trains here. Is there a way to simplify this stuff? Well, okay, so Pico here came out this last year. Where are we at here? On the camera? Yeah, you're on the, over the, here. No, the cell phone. On oh, the cell yeah. phone? Okay. Yeah. Um, with back to that same key car controller that I showed you earlier, and a board that you can purchase that allows you, this is a receiver board, quite frankly, and you can take that receiver board, just like the Aristocraft older system, and plug it in to your engines with a little bit of wiring, but you'll be able to control the speed, the direction, and it has a number of uh, at least two separate outputs that you can control the whistle, control the bell. And whether you choose to remain attached to the track as far as the source for power, or whether you choose to go with battery, it'll work either way. In fact, this board is what's sitting in that little engine that I showed you that operates it. And, and of course, the batteries are then connected to it. So they, they've taken it out and are offering it as a separate component. And you can have at it yourself as a result. And this is like less than 100 bucks for both the controller and the, and, and the for both the transmitter and the receiver here. Um, so that's out there for you too. So go at it, you know, have at it, gang. Uh, the, the sky's kind of like the limit on things here. In the business of where we go from here, well, we'll have to discuss that. Uh, there's a little bit of input required from everybody out there, whether you want, and let's say in the DCC category, do you want us to go further in depth? I, I'm always cautious about that because it tends to get into the specialist category or more individualistic issues, but we'll be glad to at least entertain that kind of capability here. Uh, the object is to still keep interest on a larger, broader basis. So there's many other facets of the hobby we want to deal with. All we've done is touch on the base on track, uh, starter sets, uh, and, and now power supplies. Yeah. And, and somewhere along the line, we got to get into the business of how to uh, plan, design, and build a garden railroad. For, hopefully the weather's going to start Let's wait till spring when yeah, we can hopefully go. Hopefully the weather's going to start on that because the best we can do tonight is, is, is show how to plow snow. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're snowbound here right now. Yeah. And, um, well, um, I think you've done an incredible job explaining all of this. And, uh, I mean, the, the table and, you know, the setup that we have here, I'll just show you guys all real quick from where I'm at. I, I, well, the poles in the way, but <laughs> we've we really uh, pulled out uh, everything but the kitchen sink tonight to uh, to put this show together. And Bill, thank you for your yeah, very good. all uh, your work putting this together. Um, I feel like I've had the easy job just running this tonight. Maybe I was going back and forth, but uh, um, you've done an amazing job pulling all of this information together for us tonight. And thank I, I, you. I assume too, we'll keep the diagrams available. Yeah, the diagrams the will be website, on so. the website for hopefully ever. Uh, I know Kent's had a little uh, website hosting issues. So he said if it if you get denied service onto the website, just refresh and it should bring you right back on. So, um, but yeah, those diagrams will be available and, and hopefully this video is on forever. <laughs> I, I think in short order, we'll probably be dealing with uh, wheels, <laughs> couplers, that, which gets more into the equipment itself. Yeah. Uh, again, we're trying to survive the winter here yeah. Uh, before we can get everybody outside 
and, and start dealing with the more hardcore aspects of planning, designing, building Garden Railroad, which we'll get to. Yeah, there will be tunnels, there will be bridges, there will be ponds. Oh yeah, well we'll be over the engine houses. Yeah, and that's another gonna... whole topic there. How, what, something to keep in mind is where do you store your trains when you're not running them? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, an important component, particularly as the railroads get bigger and you get more equipment. Uh, I, I think people really get tired real quick schlepping all the equipment from the house out to the railroad if no one if, if an accommodation wasn't made to allow the trains to run in and so you can just shut them off and walk away from them. Yeah. But that's just me. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I think, Dave, you ran into that pretty early on with your equipment. You, uh, Yeah. Yep, I did. I'm schlepping it out every day. But unfortunately, I only have a few cars at this point that I can run on that trail. But, you know, I have tunnels. I have a pond going in, this this new layout. So uh, once it warms up, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna be ready to get the ground running this spring. I your yeah. your layout's coming right along. I'm trying. Yeah, keep it going. Yeah, well, we'll be uh, filming live at your house as soon as it gets nice. So good. Be ready for us. All <laughs> we'll right. Bring in trouble. <laughs> so, um, well, our next show is going to be February seventeenth, seven o'clock, same time, probably the same basement, <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, we'll uh, we'll get a topic together before the next show, and if if you guys have something you really want to have discussed, let us know. I, we're open and always looking for ideas. So um, we will uh, go back to our every other week uh, schedule. So uh, it'll be the seventeenth, and um, I don't have a new. Uh, train layout to show you for our ending credits, but I figured running the the snowplow video from Tim Dove's layout uh, will be enjoyable again, uh, just to play in the snow. So, um, guys, any last comments? Uh, I, I think we can just sign off here and we'll stick a fork night. in it for tonight. <laughs> stick That's a right. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jed. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right, everybody. Thank you. You too. See ya.